Welcome to A.T. Stewart and Sons Ministries. I'm your host, A.T. Stewart. I'm glad you've chosen to join us today as we look into the Word of God. So take your Bibles and let's hang out in God's Word for a few moments and see what God would say to us today. Suddenly the doorbell rings and you go up to the door and there are two Cobb County detectives standing at your door and they say, we need to come in and talk to you for a moment. So you invite them in. And they say to you, we have very reliable information that one of the local gangs in our area has targeted you and your family for a home invasion to rob and to kill you. It seems that they are wanting to be a part of a national gang and part of the initiation for their group is they have to do a home invasion, rob and kill the inhabitants. We have very reliable information that your family has been chosen. Now, we don't have the resources to be able to uh, be here 24-7, but we want you to take this very seriously. Sometime in the next week or two, you can expect it to happen. Now, how would you respond to that? Would you just go about business as usual? No, I don't think so. I think you'd be on the phone to call the alarm company to install an alarm system. I think you'd get your doors reinforced. You'd get your locks changed. You may put bars on your windows. And you'd probably go down to uh, the store and get a few handguns and maybe a shotgun or two. You'd get ready, wouldn't you? If it's coming, you're going to be ready for it. Well, obviously, hopefully that's not the case with you. But I want you to know that there's a spiritual gang after you. They're called demons. And they desire to rob, kill, and destroy you. We have that on the reliable testimony of our own Lord Jesus. And they have a target on your family. You can be sure of that. Well, what are you going to do about it? I hope you're not going about business as usual thinking, well, I'm I'm okay, I'm safe. I hope you would take spiritual preparations just like you would take physical preparations if it was a physical danger. And what are the spiritual preparations you need to take? Well, we've been talking about those, and that is the arsenal that you have as your spiritual weapons. You need to avail yourselves of the spiritual weapons that God has given you to fight against the enemy, to enforce the victory that is already ours in Christ. And we're looking over in Revelation chapter 12, and we are looking at three weapons that are powerful to bring down the strongholds of the enemy. The passage deals with a time known as the tribulation. It's a midpoint of the tribulation when Satan turns up his fierce hatred and anger and forces against the Christians at that time. And it tells us that these Christians overcame Satan. And it lists three weapons of our warfare there. We looked at one last week, the blood of the Lamb. We'll look at one today and, Lord willing, one next week. But if these weapons were effective for these Christians who were enduring the greatest hostility and anger that Satan has ever turned toward the human race, how much more can you and I? in the power of God's grace, use these weapons against him. Beginning in verse 10 of Revelation chapter 12, if you will stand, let me read these verses. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb, because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even when faced with death. For this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. You may be seated. And may God bless the reading and the hearing and most of all the obeying of his word. 
Today we're looking at the weapon of our warfare known as our word of testimony. Now what is the word of testimony? Does it mean they got up in front of the church and gave a word of testimony at the service? No, I don't think so. Our word of testimony is that recalling, that speaking forth what God has done for us in the past. It would begin with your salvation experience. But it's much more than just your salvation experience. It is also the victories that God has given you over sin and temptation. It's those answers to prayer that were not coincidence but miraculous. It's those times that everything seemed impossible. Then God came through and it worked out to His glory. When you recall those, when you tell them to others, when you confess them to the devil, they become your word of testimony. A very powerful weapon against that theme of hell. Now why is our word of testimony so powerful? Because Satan works in the area of fear and deception. If he can get us to be afraid, if he can get us doubting God, he can defeat us. Satan loves to engineer situations that appear to be totally hopeless, so difficult, such huge problems and obstacles that we think, man, I'm sunk. This is impossible. Even God can't get me out of this. I'm helpless. He wants us just to give up and to quit. This is what he did with those ten spies that went into the promised land. You remember that story in the Old Testament? The nation of Israel was there at the doorway of the promised land, and so Moses sent twelve spies in to look over the situation, to do reconnaissance, and they came back, and what did they say? Ten of them said, yeah, it's flowing with milk and honey, all right, but it's also got giants over there. And these guys are so big, we're just like grasshoppers in their presence. There's no way we can defeat them. Satan had put fear and doubt into their minds, and they were embracing it. And they told the people this story of theirs, these these. Fears, these doubts, and it swept over the whole heart of the people. The scripture says the hearts of the people melted. And they chose not to go into the promised land. There were two spies, Caleb and Joshua, who spoke the word of testimony. They knew God was able. They'd seen what God had done in the past. They knew how God had delivered Israel from Egypt. How he divided the Red Sea. How he provided manna in the wilderness. They knew their God was able. They even said, these giants will be food for us. (laughs) They're just going to give us something to grow spiritually on. But Satan comes and he comes with his demons and he tells you just to give up and quit. Admit you're defeated. And if it gets bad enough... He suggests you just take your life and get it all over with. Make no mistake that that fiend of hell is out to destroy you. He wants to rob you of the joy of your salvation. He wants you to worry. He wants you to have fears. He wants you to be anxious. He wants to destroy your Christian witness. He wants you to get into sin. He wants to immobilize you behind your doubts. Well, what can you do when he attacks? You can speak the word of your testimony. I want to show you how to do that. First of all, recall what God has done in your past. Recall what God has done in your past. You see, Satan's deception and fear tactics are destroyed by the truth. Now, admit, admit that the problem is there. We're not saying live in the clouds or put your head in the sand. Admit there's a big problem, but go ahead and also admit that you've got a great God who is bigger 
than the problem you're facing. Speak forth to yourself and to the devil the great things that God has done for you in the past. First start with your salvation experience. Why start there? Because that's the greatest miracle you have ever seen. Let me tell you, for God to save you was a miracle, buddy. You say, preacher, you don't know me. Oh, but I do. Because I know me. (laughs) And you're no different than I am. Hey, we're rotten to the core. And I get that on good authority. And it's not your wife I've been talking to. It's the scripture. Over in Ephesians chapter 2. Look at what it says about us before we are saved. But God being rich in His mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions. Dead. Totally separated from God. Unable to respond. How do they tell if somebody's dead? They shine that light in the eyes and they see if their pupils respond, right? They check and see if they hear a heartbeat. There's no response. One of the realities of death is a dead person is unable to respond. Well, when you're dead in your sins, you cannot respond to God in that condition. But look what he did. When you were dead in your sins, he made us alive together with Christ. So by grace, you have been saved. When you were going your own way in your hard-hearted rebellion against God in bondage to your sin, God reached down in His grace and He saved you. He took that mind of yours that was blinded to the truth, stuck on your own thoughts, and He enlightened that mind to suddenly understand spiritual truth. Stuff you'd never understood before. Suddenly, you understood it. You realized you were a sinner separated from a holy God. And he also took that heart of stone that was hard against him, in rebellion against him, and he turned it to a heart of flesh. And you began to desire God in your life. And then, he took that will of yours that was bent toward your own selfish ends, and He energized it so you could call on Him to be your Lord and Savior. Now, that's the greatest miracle there is, bar none, that He would take us in our condition, in our depravity, and He would turn us around and implant in us eternal life and work so that we call on Him voluntarily because we want to. He didn't make any one of you get saved. He just made you want to. And do you know something? He who began the good work in you is going to continue that good work till the day of Christ Jesus. Over in Philippians chapter 1, Paul says, For I am confident of this very thing. He said, I might not be confident of much, but let me tell you, I'm confident of this. He who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. God did not send His Son to die and save you just to let you down, brother. He's going to keep working in you and He's going to work until Jesus returns to bring you into spiritual maturity. So you look back at that salvation experience. That's your first word of testimony. But then secondly, ask God to show you other ways He's worked in your life. Ask Him to show you other ways, prayers that He has answered. It's good to keep a prayer journal where you write down your prayers and then when God answers, you write those answers down. That's a faith builder. That's a word of testimony builder. As you look back at all the prayers God's answered for you. Those times that you thought, man, there is no way, but God made a way. The victories He's given you over temptations. When you've been sorely tempted and you've called upon God in His grace, and He delivered you from the temptation. 
Those providential workings of God that you knew were not coincidence. It was a sovereign God working things out. And you look back and you're amazed at it. Those are your word of testimony. If you're a new Christian, go to the Bible. Look through the Bible. Find God's working there. He's the same God today as He was in the days of Scripture. Use those as your word of testimony. So first, your salvation experience. Second, ask God to show you ways He's worked in your life. How He's answered prayers. How He's made a way where there seems to be no way. How He's taken impossible situations and worked to His glory. And then thirdly, renew your mind on these things. Think on them. The battlefield is your mind. That's where the war is waged against the enemy of our souls. He can cast thoughts into your mind. He can shoot those fiery darts into your mind. Those thoughts that jump in there that you think, where did that come from? It came from Him. Those fears, those doubts, those temptations, many of them come from Him. And that's why you need to renew those words of testimony in your mind. You need to think on them. When Satan wants to cast something, a doubt on you, you say, but now wait a minute, God did so and so and so and so. My God did this. My God did that. My God answered this prayer. Rehearse what God has done, His past faithfulness in your life, His loving kindnesses in your life. Speak those words. And on the basis of God's faithfulness, stand in peace. God has worked this way in the past, devil. He's going to work in the future. And then fourthly, speak the word of testimony. You see, the devil can't read your mind, remember? He can throw thoughts into your mind just like I can throw thoughts into your mind. That's what I'm doing right now when I'm talking. But I can't read your minds. Well, most of you I can't. So you gotta speak it. You gotta speak your word of testimony. You've got to speak out what God has done for you so the devil can hear it. Because that word of testimony will stand against his deception and his lies and will make the darkness go away when the light of the truth is spoken. The way you get rid of darkness is you interject light. Light always overcomes darkness. Your word of truth, your word of testimony of what God's done in your life is light. And when the devil tries to bring in darkness, turn on the light. Speak the word Of testimony. Let me give you some examples in Scripture. Over in 1 Samuel chapter 17, we have the story of young David, but a youth, shepherd, not a soldier, but yet he is able to stand before a giant, Goliath, unafraid. When the seasoned warriors of Israel are shaking in their boots, immobilized by their fear. Now, why is it that a young shepherd boy who's not even a soldier, never been to war, is willing to go against a giant when the seasoned warriors of Israel are immobilized by their fear? Simple answer, word of testimony. David knew how to use the word of his testimony against the fear and doubts of Satan. We pick up our story. When David has gone to see his brothers to visit them, his dad sent him and he saw and heard the taunts of Goliath against the nation of Israel and how everyone was afraid to move. And David basically said, well, what, what will Saul do for the man who conquers him? And, and they, his brothers knew what he was getting at. And so they said, well, you go see King Saul then. And that's when our story picks up in verse 31. When the words which David spoke were heard, they told them to Saul, and he sent for him. David said to Saul, 
Let no man's heart fail on account of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Then Saul said to David, You're not able to go against a Philistine to fight with him, for you're but a youth, while he's been a warrior from his youth. Now, can you smell the sulfur in that comment? You've got to learn to recognize Satan. He uses people. And only did his brothers and all the other guys say, Oh, David, be quiet. You can't do it. Here the king's telling him, You can't do that. But David said to Saul, Here he's getting his word of testimony lined up. But David said to Saul, Your servant was tending his father's sheep when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock. I went out after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, since he has taunted the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the, from the paw of the bear, He will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. That's His word of testimony. He's looking back at what God had done for him in the past, how God had enabled him to defeat the lion and the bear, and He said, This Philistine's just going to be like one of them. He knew it was the Lord who did it. The Lord delivered me, He said. And the Lord will deliver me from this Philistine. And you remember when David went out against Goliath and Goliath was taunting him. He said, you come against me with spear and sword and I come against you in the name of the Lord. The battle is the Lord's. Through the word of testimony, he overcame the fear and the doubt and defeated the giant. Another example. Is found over in the book of Jeremiah. At this time in Jeremiah's history, the Babylonians were invading Judah and they were about to destroy Jerusalem. In those days, you remember the cities were walled and they were massive walls. But time was something that they had a lot of in those days. And so what it an invading army would do sometimes is they would just put the city under siege. They would just surround the city. So nobody could go out, nobody could come in, and they would just wait until all the food ran out, all the water was gone, and the people just gave up. Well, the Babylonians weren't quite that patient, so what they did was they took dirt and they built siege mounds, which were mounds of dirt that went up to the top of the wall. And then they would just come over to the city. So they had already about completed the siege mounds against Jerusalem, but God told Jeremiah that he was going to send his people back after they were captured by the Babylonians. This was not the end of Jerusalem or his people. So he said, as a testimony to my faithfulness, I want you to buy a piece of land that the Babylonians have right now. And when you do that, you're saying to the people, I am so convinced that God is going to bring us back and we will once again control this land that I'm going to pay money for a piece of land that right now belongs to the Babylonians. And that's where we pick up our story. In Jeremiah chapter 32, beginning with verse 16. After I had given the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of Neriah, Then I prayed to the Lord, saying, here he's speaking his word of testimony. Ah, Lord God, behold, you've made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. Who shows loving kindness to thousands, but repays the iniquity of fathers and to the bosom of their children after them. O great and mighty God, the Lord of hosts is his name. Great in counsel, mighty in deed, whose eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men, giving to everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds, who has set signs and wonders in the land of Israel, and even to this day, both in Israel and among mankind. And you have made a name for yourself at this day. You brought your people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and with wonders. 
and with a strong hand and with an outstretched arm and with great terror and gave them this land which you swore to their forefathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey. And what's he doing? He's speaking the word of testimony. He's saying, guys, look at what God has done. He's created the heavens and the earth. He's delivered Israel with mighty signs and wonders. He's thinking about the plagues. He's thinking about dividing the Red Sea. He brought us into this land. Remember Jericho? God is able. God is faithful. And he defeated the fears and doubts the enemy would want to put on him by his word of testimony. He went to Scripture. If you can't come up with any in your own life, go to Scripture. That's acceptable. That's appropriate. Another example is King Jehoshaphat. You may have thought you had a bad day yesterday, but when King Jehoshaphat woke up, he was really having a bad day because three nations had gathered on the borders to make war with him. And they were much stronger than he was. He knew that Judah did not have a chance at all of defeating them in their own strength. So he sought God. And in his prayer, he uses the word of testimony. Let's pick up our scripture in Second Chronicles chapter 20, beginning with verse 17. Excuse me, we'll begin with the verses you have there. And he said, O Lord, the God of our fathers, you are not, are you not God in heaven? And are you not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in your hand so that no one can stand against you. Did you not, O our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? They have lived in it, have built you a sanctuary there for your name, saying, Should evil come upon us, the sword or judgment or pestilence or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house, and cry to you in our distress, and you will hear and deliver us. That's his word of testimony. He's talking about God's faithfulness and what God had done. And he knew because God had been faithful in the past, God was going to be faithful for them now. And God spoke through a prophet after that prayer. As we pick up in verse 17. You need not fight in this battle. Station yourselves, stand and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out to face them, for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, weeping, excuse me, worshiping the Lord. The Levites from the sons of the Korathites and the sons of the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a very loud voice. He spoke the word of testimony about God's faithfulness. God said, I'm going to be faithful for you tomorrow, just like I've been in the past. And they were so encouraged, they were so filled with faith, that when it came time for the battle, he sent the choir out in front of the army. And the choir went out and started praising God, and God sent ambushes, he sent his angelic hosts to destroy those opposing armies. He spoke the word of testimony and saw the enemy defeated. Let's look at one more biblical example, and that is Paul himself. Paul is in prison. He's close to death. He's been in prison before, but God has released him and delivered him from the other times, but it doesn't appear God's going to deliver him this time. Paul is there, wasting away. I can assure you, Satan cast his fiery darts at say at Paul. Why haven't you been delivered like earlier, Paul? You're not fulfilling your life's goal. You wanted to spread the word of God throughout the world, and here you are stuck in this prison. You're not fulfilling your ministry. But Paul 
spoke the word of testimony. He says, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that He is able to guard what I have entrusted to Him until that day. Paul says, God has delivered me. He's delivered me from shipwrecks. He's delivered me three times from being beaten with rods. He's delivered me from being stoned and left for dead. He's delivered me every time, and I can trust my ministry into His hands. And I'm exactly where He wants me to be. And it was in that prison cell that He wrote some of those letters that we have today that have ministered to Christians throughout the ages. He spoke the word of testimony. I am a strong believer in the sovereignty of God. You have heard me proclaim it over and over and over again. And sometimes I get in situations and things just don't look like I would think they should look. And Satan likes to throw his darts at me. Oh, God's not in control. God doesn't care. God let you down. I like to speak the word of testimony. Back when I was in high school, uh, several of us guys and the football coach formed a singing group. It's called the Coaches Crew, kind of a folk band. And we would travel around to various youth groups, and we would sing, and then we'd give our testimonies. Well, one Saturday afternoon, we were going to the place that we were going to be sharing. We were in several different cars. In the car that I was in, we'd get up to about 30 miles an hour and it would cut off. So we'd start it up again, get up to about 30 miles an hour, cut off. Now the other car was way gone. And this was back before cell phones, so you were stuck. <laughs> you know, you were stuck when you were there. And so we stopped, got out of the car, opened up the hood like we knew what we were doing, but we didn't. And we, you know, we sit around and looked at it like guys do. And I said, guys, why don't we pray? So we just prayed and said, God, you know that we have this appointment to go and share about you. And you know the problem we have with this car. And we don't know what's wrong, but we're just going to ask you to fix this. Take care of the situation so we can go. By the time I said amen, we heard this car approaching from the distance, just topping the hill. Now this was... We were just outside of town of about 2,000 people where one of our guys lived. So everybody knows everybody. And this guy that happened to be coming over the hill was a mechanic. <clears throat> now, there's only about four mechanics in the whole town. All right? So the guy topping the hill is a mechanic. Well, he recognizes one of our guys, so he pulls over. And we tell him the situation. He's working on it. He says, I think I know the problem. Well, you know, I can't, I can't stand this. I just got to ask some questions. So I said to him, I said, where you been? He said, well, I've been out fishing. Well, I know it's, what, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock. Fish, you know, they don't bite till it gets dusk. And so I was thinking, do you always come home this early from fishing? He said, no, I don't. But he said, I couldn't catch anything today. He said, you know, usually I catch just more fish than I know what to do with at this place. But they were not biting today. So I decided to come home early. Well, I couldn't be satisfied just with that. And I said, do you always come home this way? He said, no, I usually don't. But just for some reason, I felt like I ought to come home this way today. He messed around in there with the carburetor a little bit. Got us started. Car ran fine on our way. No enemy wants to come and try to tell me God's not in control. I just say, devil... My guy controls the fish's bite. He controls the way a man goes home, even who doesn't know him. Don't tell me he's not in control. I know he is. Will you use your word of testimony this week against the enemy? when he wants to cast those fears and doubts, those worries in your mind. Speak the word of testimony. In faith. And he will flee. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. 
I thank you for the word of testimonies that you've given all of us. If you've worked in our lives in ways that we know this is not coincidence. This is a work of a sovereign God. May we use those words of testimony this week against the enemy of our souls. In Jesus' name, amen.